Hello, my name is Ugeche and welcome to Hugo's Desk. Today, since I'm on set, I figured maybe to do a tutorial about lens grids. On this tutorial, we're going to basically go through how to line up the lens grid, how to properly measure it, having it in 90 degrees and actually leveled, and then we're going to shoot a couple of lenses to show you the process. At the end, we'll go inside Nuke and basically undistort our footage. Before we even begin, let's talk about why do we need the lens grid in the first place. Without making it too scientific and simple terms, we need a lens grid because lens distortion will make your 3D tracking much more difficult. If you look at the edges of a frame, the wider the lens is, the more distortion you have. There are typically two types of distortion. Barrel distortion, making the image look like it's been mapped around the sphere, and pincushion distortion, making it look like the image is bow inwards, towards the center. The problem is that when you want a 3D track footage, the pixels in the edge move differently from the ones in the center. So tracking software will probably assume these are either moving objects or it will discard this information and not use it during the solve of the track. Effectively, a lens grid can help you remove all this distortion and straighten your image. Basically stretching and warping the image until all lines in the footage are straight and easily trackable by a 3D package. You're probably thinking, can't I just use the lines in the image? And yes, you can. If you, for example, are filming a building, you have plenty of straight lines in the image to use as a reference for distortion. But what happens if you have actors moving in the frame? Or if you're filming a forest or an environment without any straight lines? A lens grid will allow you to effectively plot and map the entire lens so you can correctly unwarp the distortion. But like I said, this is a very simple explanation. You can find a lot more about this topic in the links left below on the description. To film a lens grid, you need some kind of support. It can be a C-stand, it can be light stands, or even a tripod, as long as it can be easily adjusted in terms of height. We'll also need some lights. It's important to have a bright and sharp grid. It can really be any type of light. And of course, you need the grid itself. You should try to print it on a hard surface to avoid any curvature or wrinkles. And don't forget it needs to be large enough to reach the edges of the frame, especially if you're using a very wide lens. You can find more information of how to make a proper lens grid in this website from Eric Alba. Last but not least, you need someone to help you. This is really a two-man job, so say hello to Bjorn. We start by placing the stands. It also works if you use a wall, as long as it's straight. Because this specific green screen studio we used is curved, we couldn't really use a wall this time. Using some clamps, we hold the grid in place. You can use the lines in the grid to make sure the clamps are at the same height on both sides. Using an inclinometer, a spirit level or a phone app, you can keep adjusting until you reach zero degrees. It should be relatively simple. It's now time to bring in the camera. This should be the camera used on set to film the footage that you will use in visual effects or 3D track. You need to use the same camera, the same settings, the same specific lens. It can't really be another lens, even if it's the same model of the lens. Be careful because they do have some micro differences in distortion between them. You can now start lining up the camera with the grid. It usually helps if you have a monitor to check. I personally find that the best method to line up the grid is to use the center cross on the camera's viewfinder and match it with the actual cross that is printed on the grid. Make sure the camera is leveled. Just like with the grid, you can use an inclinometer, a spirit level, or a phone app. The grid should also be straight in relationship with the camera. Make sure to adjust the light so the grid is nice and bright. Pull focus and have the grid as sharp as possible. I personally use a focus sharp and focus peaking on the camera, but it's not mandatory. Regarding f-stop, just like when filming HDRs, it's important to film the grid as sharp as possible with a very high f-stop. I usually try to get to f22, but depending on the lens and on the available lights, you might need to use a lower f-stop. As you know, time is money on set, so sometimes I have used f8 because it would have taken too long to set up more lights just for the lens grid. Lens distortion is all about accuracy, but you need to make the right call depending on your project. My advice to you is if you're filming a very big budget production, then you should take the time to make your lens grids perfect. But if you're running a low budget production, then maybe perhaps an F8 lens grid is more than enough. Being a VFX supervisor is all about creating a balance between quality and budget. Try to make a smart decision and don't be too precious when it's not appropriate. If you do have a lot of lenses to film, perhaps the best way would be to get a dolly so you can move the camera easily and swap the lenses. <laughs> By the way, make sure you use a slate on all the grids. 
Otherwise, you'll never know what lens or what f-stop you used. Now that we have the grid film, let's bring it into new. Please note that you can use any compositing or 3D tracking application for this step. So here is our footage inside of Nuke. As you can see, the lens distortion on this specific footage is quite extreme. I'm going to leave the node mostly on default settings for now. This is a spherical lens, so standard settings should work well. Go to the Analyze area and click Detect. Nook will try to plot the grid and create an overlay using lines and crosses. These represent the distortion warp grid. It's probably wise to reduce the f-stop and gamma a touch, so you can actually see the overlay better. At this stage, you might have to help Nook to get an accurate map distortion. Remove any crosses or lines that don't look correct, and move any others into the correct positions along the grid. This might take some time, but it will really be worth it. The more exact the grid and the more exact the crosses are, the more accurate your solve is. Once you're done, you can select Solve, and the overlay will turn green. This means the distortion calculation is now finished. But as you can see, nothing has happened to your image. Don't forget that by default, Nuke makes an ST map with the distortion, since it's industry practice to render these maps to 32-bit float EXR and then distribute them with the rest of the visual effects team. These maps can be used on any shot filmed with this lens camera combo. They're used to remove the distortion from the footage, so you can do 2D or 3D tracking, but they are also used to add distortion to any 3D or matte painting element you want to comp on top of this image. If you select Undistort in the mode selection, you can now see that our grid is completely straight. It was so warped that it even goes beyond the limits of our bounding box or canvas. Now that you have this node, you can either use the SD map that you've rendered as an EXR, or use the node directly to undistort any footage filmed with this lens and camera duo. Please note that using the node itself is much slower than the SD map node. Here are two more examples of the same process. One example is a 24mm Canon lens with an Urza Mini Pro G1, and the second one is a 50mm Canon with the same camera. Notice how much the image warps even on the 50mm lens. This curvature in the lens, even if small, is enough to make your 2D and 3D tracking attempts very difficult. And so always remember, film a lens grid. It will save you money, time and a lot of headaches. And that is it for today. Hope you've enjoyed the video. Don't forget to subscribe to Hugo's Desk and leave a comment below if you have any questions. I'll see you next time.